So I want to build a coil gun and I've wanted to do so for a long time and I very recently started actually working on it. I have a very good understanding of how coil guns work in general so I felt like I had put enough thought into it and I could just go gun ho straight into it and I'd be able to produce a working final product. But recently I've been putting a lot more thought into not just what I need to do to build a coil gun but instead how a coil gun should be built in the first place. I've done a little bit more research on how other people have successfully or unsuccessfully built their iterations of a coil gun, and it seems that there's really only one way that people have attempted to do it. And based off of some of my preliminary testing and watching other people's tests and looking at their calculations and everything like that, I've come to the conclusion that the way that everyone's trying to do this thing really just won't work, or if it does work, it will barely work. I've seen people develop this entire massive apparatus for a coil gun and then only be able to produce efficiencies of around three or four percent optimistically. So based off of that alone, clearly we haven't been doing something right and there's some serious development to be had. So instead of trying to copy what other people have already done and has ended up being unsuccessful, I've come up with some new ideas of my own, some new ways to make this work that I think could potentially get me that higher efficiency that I'm looking for. As I see it, the biggest problem with developing a coil gun is a matter of energy, or more specifically, the energy transfer. The energy transfer itself is going from stored electrical potential energy to kinetic energy, and you're trying to get the highest efficiency between point A and point B. The problem is not energy capacity. Any standard lithium ion battery can store an insurmountable amount of energy more than any chemical based gun could ever produce. The real problem is just being able to release that energy quick enough to produce a high kinetic energy. Because generally electrical power sources are really good at storing a good deal of energy but not good at releasing it very quickly and that's the whole point, that's what we need to accomplish here. The simplest and most obvious way to accomplish this very quick energy release is with capacitors. Capacitors allow you to store up a great deal of energy over a long duration and then release all of it within a matter of milliseconds. So I first thought using capacitors would seem to be the absolute ideal for a system like this and as such pretty much every coil gun that you will see uses a very large capacitor bank to store up and then quickly release their energy. But these systems like I said earlier generally only accomplish an efficiency of around three to four percent and I think that the capacitor itself is the problem. And that if we really want to be able to do this the right way, then capacitors are not the way to go. If I create a graph here of voltage over time, the voltage being the potential across the capacitor, then if I discharge a capacitor across a constant load, the discharge curve looks something like that. So when you first begin to discharge a capacitor, you have a very high voltage and because of that a very high current, but then that voltage very very quickly drops off to almost nothing after a very short duration. Usually the capacitor will take less time to fully discharge than it will take the projectile to move through one coil in a electromagnetic accelerator. This is not good, but even if that wasn't the case, I still think that a capacitor discharge curve like this would never be ideal. So let me explain. So let's say that this is the cross-section of a coil in a coil gun. We'll say that the projectile is moving from left to right, and the projectile itself will begin its path right around here. So if I just left this coil on with a constant current going through it, the projectile would be pulled to the center. So instead of right at the beginning, it would be right around here where it would sit permanently. The reason it will rest here is because this is where the force is strongest. When it's just at the beginning, a minimal amount of the projectile itself is exposed to the magnetic fields that are being generated by the air core solenoid. So the actual applied force is fairly little. So then if the projectile is anywhere but the middle, the force pulling it towards the center will be stronger than the force pulling it back out. So now consider how this plays with the capacitor discharge curve. Ideally, you would want to have the highest current flowing through the electromagnet when you have the potential to apply the greatest force to your projectile. That would mean that you would want the capacitor bank to discharge when the projectile is right at the center, so that you can apply the greatest amount of force to propel it forward. But that's not what happens. Instead, the capacitors discharge pretty much right when the 
projectile is at the very front of the electromagnet. So your capacitor is discharged and some force, but not a lot, is applied since the ferromagnetic projectile is not exposed to the electromagnet very much and the capacitor immediately discharges. So for the duration that the projectile is going through the coil, no, no force is being applied to it, or at least very little force is. So then the alternative would be somehow discharging it right when it's at the center, but that doesn't work either. So if your discharge curves goes right when it's in the center like this, you initially have a very high current, so you're applying a very good force to it, pulling it forward, which is exactly what you want, but then when it gets past the center, you still have that discharge, which is then pulling it back towards the center and eliminating your forward momentum. So neither extreme is ideal. So you end up having to have the discharge halfway between the very beginning and the center to compromise between these extremes. So ignoring the actual electromagnet and the current going through it, what you really want is either a constant force on the projectile throughout its travel or a force that is accelerating, increasing as the projectile moves forward. And the capacitor discharge offers you neither of those. But I do have an idea about what one could do to potentially increase the efficiency of a coil gun. So you could try to do more complicated electronic stuff to change this kind of discharge curve or try and flip it, something like that. But all of that is very complicated and would take a whole lot more than is necessary for something like this. I also think that even if you do do that, it won't get you the results that you would be looking for because the coil shape itself is fundamentally flawed. So what I propose is instead of using a coil geometry where everything is constant throughout like so and as pretty much everything is used is to instead to use a coil geometry something more like this where the thickness of the wrap starts very low towards the one end and then increases as it goes down the length of the barrel. So the idea with this is instead of using a capacitor to discharge it, you can instead just use a high voltage battery to apply a constant current to the inductor. So by using just a high voltage battery, you are immediately eliminating the concern with a quick discharge time that doesn't get you the current where you want it. And I do think that an altered geometry like this offers a, a few potential um, great benefits. First thing is that the center of the force is dramatically altered. So due to this geometry, since you have a lot more coils on the one side than you do the other, the center of the force is going to strongly favor that one side. So instead of the projectile resting in the middle like it would normally, the projectile would rest at the end here. This means that you can have a shorter projectile relative to the coil length, where normally the projectile would have to be about the same length as the coil itself. This one can be significantly smaller because your sensor would go just on the end here and would still be able to sense it because it's not going to the center, it's going to the end. This also means a constant acceleration throughout the coil, not just half of it. So if you had a constant current going through a normal coil, it's only accelerating for half of that length, and the other half it's just pulling, being pulled forward by its momentum. With this, since the center is at the end, it's being pulled forward the entire time. But I think the big thing here is how this can potentially be scaled. Exactly what kind of curve this line should follow is a very important question to ask. But depending on what kind of curve you're using, you could potentially make it so that the entire barrel is just one singular coil. And then you would only need one singular sensor at the end and not a whole complicated series of them. So for example, if this line here followed the curve of the graph of the inverse of x, then you could potentially have dramatic results. The area under the curve of the inverse of x going from zero to something greater than zero will always be infinity. Because of that, in a pure mathematical sense, if you had something like this with the inverse of x, the force in front of it would always, always, always be greater than that behind it since it's going to infinity, theoretically. That would mean that your coil could be as long as you wanted and there would always be a greater force in front of it. Your coil could be a, a meter long and still the projectile would rest at the very end of it, no matter the projectile's length. So then you could have truly constant acceleration throughout the entirety of the barrel, not just small chunks of it, and it would be potentially infinitely scalable, and you could have any proportion of projectile length to barrel length or coil length, and it would not affect the system whatsoever. I think that this potentially could create some 
very interesting results. And as such, I wound a small prototype coil. This thing is by no means perfect and is definitely not the final krill geometry, but it is a really good place to start. So this first curve that I tried here can be mathematically modeled by log base two of X. So I put one full layer under everything here, but then the second layer, I made only half the length of the first one. And the third layer is only half the length of the second one and then so on as far as I could go practically. So that created this kind of shape. I also made a couple of these little steel projectiles. One is slightly longer than the other. So I'm going to go ahead and stick this longer projectile a little bit in the barrel, turn on my power supply, and then connect 5 amps through these two. So if I draw 5 amps, that's enough to move the projectile, and you'll see it goes to where the force is strongest, and it lies right around the end here. It lies something around 8 millimeters outside the end, and if I do the same thing with this smaller projectile, Ideally, it would stick out the same amount outside the end, but you'll see that's not the case. So it goes to the center of the force, and it sticks around like five millimeters outside the end. So what that tells me is that this geometry, this coil geometry, is not infinitely scalable as I would desire. So if I had a projectile that was significantly smaller, it wouldn't stick outside the end at all, which means you couldn't detect that it has gotten to the center of force and then you couldn't shut off the coil and nothing would uh, come out. But either way, I am gonna try it out. So I'm gonna go quick, chop this shredder projectile in half, and then we can see if it sticks out at all. So I've now got this smaller projectile. Stick it in the end here, turn it on and it doesn't come out at all. So the center of force is keeping it inside the barrel, which is, of course, a bad thing. I have done a little bit of testing with this using this longest projectile. I've got this 5,000 milliamp hour 12 volt battery here. So what I've been doing is sticking the projectile in the barrel so that the tip of it is just inside the end of the coil here. And then I'll jam one end into one of the electrodes of the battery and then kind of just brush the other end into the electrode to give it some high current for a very short amount of time. It's super janky and not good at all, and all the timing is off, but it still has been able to launch projectile at a considerable speed. So I'll try and do that again here for you on video. All right, let's see if we can get a good one here. And this is stupid, so don't do this. I just shot backwards, which it also has a tendency to do if you're being this ridiculous with your firing mechanism. That was okay. Backwards again. Ah, oh, come on. That was okay. Oh! That one was pretty good. You might be able to see there's some dents in this power supply here. That is from the projectile hitting it. But more prominently, there is a fairly significant dent in the base of this 3D printer frame here that happens to fit the tip of the projectile really well. So I know it was going fast enough to at least put a little divot in this solid aluminum frame. And I used the height of this dent and the height off the table that I was firing it at along with the angle that this is at to mathematically model the trajectory. And based off of that, it was going about 35 feet per second, which is pretty considerable for doing nothing correctly at all. Like the friction-based connections here are terrible and certainly add a ton of resistance to the equation, which is only limiting the current. 12 volt battery is the absolute minimum and it's also not even charged up all the way to 12 volts. And then for this geometry, the timing is especially important. Any more or less can dramatically affect it. And I'm doing nothing with timing, nothing at all, where it should be controlled by a microcontroller and fine-tuned down to the fraction of a millisecond. I'm just blindly doing it and hoping it goes well. So 35 feet per second is an absolute minimum. Like this thing could probably do more like 50 feet per second had I have the proper connections and the proper timing set up. 
So I ended up kind of totally rethinking how I was going to do the this entire project. I'm no longer going to need the capacitors for it, at least I don't think I will. I'm sure I'll be able to find a cool use for those anyways, but not this. But this coil here has been pretty promising. I'm very happy with that, what I've been able to do so far. My thought is that in the end, I'll end up making a very large uh, lithium ion battery. So I'll use 18650 cells to develop a battery. So that's rated for very high voltage. So this is 12 volts. I'm thinking at least 10 times the voltage here, which then means at least 10 times the current for the same load. But my next step is to make another one of these steps instead of using a logarithmic curve to use the inverse of X curve. Again, like I said earlier, the inverse of X has the theoretical potential to be perfect. Of course, reality will not reflect theory, especially for this kind of case, but it will almost certainly be better. I'm probably going to need to have like a 3D printed cap on the end here just to hold all the wire in place better, but that shouldn't add too much consideration. So I am very happy with what I've been able to do with this, and I'm excited to get ready making the next attempt. So I hope you learned something from this. I certainly have learned quite a bit. I'm trying to figure out how everything here can work together. It has turned out to be quite the problem-solving challenge. But that's all I have for now, so bye.